Most of you know that we have, or many of you at least, that we have gone through a series that we called Necessary. And so today we are switching. Now, we kind of rounded that up last time, and I want to do three uh, Sundays in a row here, and I hope you'll take good notes, and I hope you'll invite other people, and, and if uh, they couldn't be here today, tell them to go uh, listen also. The book of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, or however you want to say it. I think it's Habakkuk. Uh, but if you look at that, there are three chapters, and they are extraordinarily powerful chapters because he expresses so much of what we ourselves sometimes and maybe very often are going through. The first chapter, he, he's kind of asking this question, how, how in the world? Well, is it that God has disappeared when, when life is hard, when, when things are tough and I can't make heads or tails of anything, how do I search for God when he seems absent? Then the next chapter, he's waiting for God. How, how do you wait for God when he seems to be slow? He could just have moved quicker. That would have fit my schedule so much better. None of you have ever tried that, Yeah. And then the last one, he's, he's, he's suddenly seeing God showing up. And, and, and how do you recognize that it is God that shows up and not just some things that happen? Powerful, powerful, powerful little uh, book here uh, by, by the prophet Habakkuk. So I want us to look at that. And I think uh, that we all kind of are aware that when we look around, we see a world that is just going crazy, right? And and I'm going to use some strong words because I think they are pretty strong, uh, what we are seeing around us. Right? We're being polarized like never before. Things are divided. We see evil show its head like I, I don't remember in my lifetime seeing it that kind of brutally showing up. Sh shootings everywhere in schoolyards and restaurants and in gathering places, you know, just about everywhere. I just looked it up uh, this morning to see uh, we are in 302 mass shooting this year. Evil shows its face everywhere, right? There, there's just a complete blatant disregard for God uh, everywhere, and pretty much on a general kind of notice, uh, the church is considered somewhat irrelevant uh, for things beyond, you know, maybe personal religion. And you get into this kind of situation, and we see some of that even in our personal, personal situation. We all kind of live through a time like this, or we face times like this, where things seem to be heavy. They seem to be kind of indifferent. It doesn't matter kind of what we do. It's depressing. It's uninspiring. I find myself uninspiring, unimpressive, all of that kind of stuff. And that kind of paralyzing uh, reality or experience of reality hit us hard and it hit us double hard I think sometimes when we feel like we're kind of supposed to be doing all right you know we, we we're doing okay we're supposed to we're supposed to be the kind of people that have a little bit of extra energy the kind of people who can see solutions the kind of people that ought to be able to handle these kinds of things and yet sometimes we have to admit that we come up short. There seems to be no inspiration, no real strength, no real power. And so we do. What do we do when we feel that way? You know, it's not an uncommon experience. So you don't have to sit, sit around and thinking, I feel that, probably nobody else does. Most people, if not all people, at one time or another, are facing this. Instead of being inspired and fresh and ready, they feel tired and down and down. Personal struggles are only real, and we know them. Loneliness and, and mental illness and, and just various kinds of issues are hitting us like never before. Anger, division, hate, and pain no matter how much we have and how wealthy we seem to be how pretty our lives look we are facing these things 
And so what do we do? And sometimes I think it's true even more so for Christians. Now, it's hard enough when it hit us like that for human beings, but for Christians, when, when we at the center of our worldview have the very clear conviction that, that there is an almighty God who has presented himself to us as a loving father, when that is reality, and then we, we, we compare that to our experience sometimes of the kind of pain and the difficulty and the struggle and the confusion that come our way, it is, it is almost like a frontal attack on our very understanding of reality. And so, like never before, friends, we need a word. Like never before, it, we need for God to become visible. Like never before, we need for him to give us a vision, an image, something that let us know that he is here. If we never needed it before, it seems like we need it now. Have you ever cried out and said, God, why have you hidden yourself to me? Most people do. And, and so what happens, we, we cry out, and heaven sometimes seems quiet. Actually, when it shouldn't have been, we feel like. And doubt just hammers us in every way possible. So how do you search for God when he seems to be absent? That is exactly the situation that we find with the prophet Habakkuk. He found himself in the most terrible turmoil that you can imagine, both socially and internationally, politically, personally. Things around him were out of control. It looked as if God had completely just flat left his people. The situation was at an all-time low. The social injustice among the people had divided them, and now evil was showing its face even in the holy center of Zion. The, the empire of Babylon was, was kind of spreading. It was on its march, if you will. It was kind of going forward in every direction. It was just a matter of time before it would swallow up Jerusalem. God's own city will become a subsidiary, a little area under the great empire of this pagan nation called Babylon. And it was in the midst of that morass of God forsakenness that we find a frustrated, worried, confused prophet who lifts his voice out and cry out to God, God, for crying out loud, where are you? When it is most necessary for you to show up, I can't seem to hear you. I can't seem to see you. Where are you? It wouldn't be long until the devastation that was going on was the crisis that would lead to the utter destruction of Jerusalem and flat out the destruction of the temple where they pulled the rocks apart and pulled cedar planks apart, destroyed the temple, and God's own people would be taken captive and exiled to a foreign land someplace else. God, if you are there, let me hear from you. And heaven remained quiet. Do you recognize that in your life? You know, your situation is different. Everybody's situation is different. But can you see the devastation, feel that with Habakkuk? I'll read the first few verses of chapter 1 till verse 13 and then the first verse of chapter 2. How long, Lord, 
Must I call for help? This is the back of praying up, right? And you don't listen. How long must I cry out about violence and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Look at the nation. God is answering his question. And he says, look at the nation. This is absurd. Be utterly astounded. For I'm doing something in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. Look, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories that are not their own. They're fierce and terrifying. Their views of justice and sovereignty stem from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than wolves of the night. Their horsemen charge their head. Their horsemen come from distant lands. They fly like eagles, swooping to devour. All of them come to do violence. Their faces are set in determination. They gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings, and rulers are a joke to them. They laugh at every fortress and build siege ramps to capture it. They sweep by like the wind and pass through. They're guilty. Their strength is their God. Habakkuk prays again, and he says, Are you not from eternity, Lord my God? My Holy One, you will not die. Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock you destined them to punish us. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallow up one who is more righteous than himself? And then chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk says, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he says to me and what I should conclude or reply about my complaint. This is tough. How long, O oh Lord? How long must I cry out for help? And you don't even answer. Is that your cry? Maybe yours. If you're tuning in just for the first time or just by happenstance, maybe you thought that. How long should I cry out? Everybody who thinks about life, everybody who cares about the world around them, everybody who, who pays attention and notice the evil that is going on, the direction that they see things are going. Everyone who cares about having some kind of meaning, direction, and, and, uh, and purpose in life, they've had those thoughts. They are bombarded time and again with frustration and doubt about what's going on. Why does heaven seem to be silent exactly at the point where it seems to be most obvious that we should hear from God. Wouldn't it have been much better if God had made himself present right at this point? Even those of you who are not kind of crying that doubt out or that confusion out, sometimes in your quiet moments, you would have asked that question. Where are you, O Lord? I can't see him to see your hand. Why is your way so different from the way that I think it should have been? Now, two questions come up immediately with this. One is, of course, what in the world is God doing when we hurt 
when we feel like things are not doing right, we need to hear from him. What is he doing? And then from that follows an obvious question also of this, of course, is what are we supposed to do? When apparently <laughs> he's doing something else. Well, can we find answers in the book of Habakkuk? I think we can. I think we can learn quite a bit from him. The first we notice, of course, is that Habakkuk turned his doubt, his frustration, his pain to God. It does not even dawn on him to doubt the existence of God. It is one thing to doubt that you can't understand what God is doing. It's another thing to doubt his existence. Are you hearing this? You know, nowadays there are people that are willing to doubt anything. They doubt the theology of God's word. They doubt the, the ethical kind of conviction that carries God's word. They, they, they doubt just about anything that has to do with God, and they doubt God himself. And sometimes they even find each other in groups and, and create echo chambers where they can be affirmed and be even louder in their doubt about God even being important and around. And conclusion is that God is never, or no longer at least, truly involved at a part of the picture. But look at Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a man who, who is not afraid of expressing his confusion. He's not afraid of expression, expressing how he feels and why he's, he, he just don't understand what God is doing. But deep in his soul, he is anchored in the conviction that if he's ever to get through that confusion, ever to get through that pain, and again find peace and a way of trusting the world, so to speak, what's going on, trusting life, he will have to bring his despair to God himself. And so he says, Lord, speak to me. You've done it before. Speak again. That's why he concludes this by saying, I'm going to stand at the lookout tower and really be alert to what God is doing. My question to you this morning, friends, is where do you bring your doubt, your frustration? That God does not act the way you wish he would. Are you pulling back in isolation? Are you finding others you can agree with and just create an echo chamber and you all just make each other louder and highlight your own confusion and doubt? Are you clenching your teeth and saying, I'm going to get through this whether God is with me or not? Or, or, do you realize with Habakkuk that what has happened is not that God has stopped acting, but things are happening that you don't understand because you can't quite understand how he acts. And because that is how things work, the only way to get through your doubt, through your frustration, through your confusion, is to seek closer to him, to cry out to him for help. That God is silent, at least to you, does not mean, of course, that he has stopped acting and that he's not involved. I want you to notice how God is answering Habakkuk here, right? Look at, at verse 5 that we read just a moment ago, right? Look at the nations, God said, and observe, be utterly astounded. I'm doing things that you can't even fathom. What happened here is that God is showing his servant, Habakkuk, that he is not withdrawn, that he is deeply engaged, and he will always be so that God in his almighty power 
has the ability to take what is evil, even use people and nations that are evil, and turn it into something that is good. He does that globally, but he can do that also personally. Your struggles, your pain, where you can't see which way to go or how to figure it, he can take that and turn it into something beautiful, something useful, something peaceful. God's people had had quite a roller coaster ride through their history. They've had a lot of bad kings. Had some good kings. And then another bunch of bad kings. They have seen revival where the whole people had turned to God and, and they saw what God was doing in their midst in the greatest way. And then they had periods of apostasy when the whole people turned their, their back to God and went their own way. And the prophet is looking through and back over all these things and he says, God, please do something. Everything is going haywire. And God says, I am doing something. Maybe you are experiencing that I'm quiet or silent at the moment, but I'm not. I'm fully involved in your situation. But I follow my ways and not your ways. I'm the Lord and you're not. <laughs> That's a good thing to be reminded of, is it not? I'm in control and have not lost my control even in your situation. Who do you think will raise up nations when they rise up? Who do you think will let them come down when they come down? I do that, the Lord said. I have not moved away. Friends, this is a tough, tough lesson. It's easy to say. I think most of you, if you've been Christian for just a little while, you will agree that this is how it is. But that doesn't mean that we have learned the lesson. Does God seem absent to you? I speak to you as individuals, maybe even sometimes as a church or a group in the church. The word here, do not despair. He has not forgotten you, that he is silent to your ear and invisible to your eyes does not mean that he is not engaged in your world. It is not God the Almighty's task to place his road exactly where your eyes are looking or to speak about his plans in the room where your ear listens happens to be listening. Habakkuk's experience with God was that God was love. And because God is love, he can't not act. He has to be involved. That's what he expresses in verse 13. He says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You can't tolerate wrongdoing. In other words, I know you'll be involved. I just can't see it. I don't understand how. Talk to me. So let me ask you this. Do you have a place? A place where you can get away. Away from the business, stress, the struggles, the pain, just the way, and just be you with God. A place where you can cry out, let him know about all the things that you don't understand. Fuss at him if you need to. Express to him how much you need to hear from him. Listen to him. Be quiet and reflect on God's word. The promise from God is, of course, that he is always active. 
And the frustration in your life, the tiredness in your life, comes exactly when you can't seem to see him work. If God has become absent to you, seek him. You are not absent to him. Maybe I can illustrate it with a biblical illustration. You all remember, some of you may not, you can read about it in, in Genesis chapter 37, a big hunk of Genesis, but right here, that's case in point. Joseph, who was the second youngest son of the 12 sons of the patriarch Jacob. Joseph woke up and he had a dream. His 11 brothers already kind of felt like he was the favorite of his father. And he had a dream, and he was dumb enough to tell his brothers. <laughs> and so he says, here's my dream. I, I, I dreamt that there was 12 sheaves, and one was in the center, and the other 11 sheaves were around it, and they were all bowing to the one in the middle. Now, they hated him for that. And so they decided to kill him, and then they decided, no, no, let's not do that. But I wonder if you had ever thought about what went through his mind in the events that followed that. He hadn't done anything wrong. He just told them what he dreamt. It was a very vivid, real dream, so he told them about it. They were his brothers, that his father preferred him over them. You know, how was that his fault? What had he done wrong? Where is God? And now then they didn't kill him. They decided to sell him as a slave. And he became a slave. And God was quiet. Then he was sold to Potiphar, the captain of the, of the guards for the Pharaoh. And things began to turn. And, and he became a trusted person. And, and finally, he rose to the top of the ranks in, the, in Potiphar's house. And it seems as if things were getting better. You know, but still, you all are thinking, well, that just, he just got sold, and then boom, now he's the second man in command. There, there was a long period of time, probably about 10 years, where he was just a slave, where he was kind of cleaning out under the animal, so to speak where every little boy around could tell him whatever to do, and there was no, I quit. He was a slave. Day out, day in, day out. God, where are you? What have I done to lose your blessing? And then now when he gets to the top of the whole thing, Potiphar's wife is trying to seduce him into a sexual relationship. And what does he do? He says, no. No. He does what is right in God's eyes. And what happens? He gets thrown in jail. God, why are you silent? What did I ever do wrong? Where are you? We don't know how long he was in jail, but it was at least two years, but a decent timeline would probably make it look something like close to eight years at least. The worst hole you could stick a prisoner in, right? It's a hole of the of the slaves. There was no trial. There was no hearing. There was no place to have a request for leniency or anything like that. The only thing he could look forward to was to rot with the rats. And then suddenly, then suddenly, a cupbearer comes. But think of the other. Where's God? Year in, year out, day in, day out. And a cupbearer and a baker comes to the and, and they had a dream so vivid that they wanted it interpreted and nobody could do it, so they asked Joseph, and he says, as if, as if he had not gone through all this time when God being silent. He says, no one can interpret that except for God. 
And God gives him the interpretation, and he interprets, and then the, 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 the cupbearer goes back to his normal job for, for, the, for the emperor, for Pharaoh. And you should think, well, maybe he will tell about Joseph. At least Joseph was so sick of his situation that, please talk to the Pharaoh about me. But he forgets all about that until God gives Pharaoh a dream. Are you hearing this? Day in, day out. God, where are you? And Pharaoh now has a dream. And it was so vivid to him, he needed it interpreted. He knew there was something real going on. And the cupbearer suddenly remembered his fellow prisoner, Joseph. And they called Joseph out. And God gives him the interpretation. And the rest, of course, as you know, belong to the history of the world. Joseph was taken from that prison and became the mightiest person in Egypt right after Pharaoh. God says, you see, Joseph, I've been there all the time. I've been planning. I prepared you. I let the nation. You needed to be there and be ready for a time like this where you can lead this nation and indeed all the nations around through this very difficult time of famine. I needed you ready for this. And I needed the world around you ready for this. I was never gone. I was always there. Friend, can I say this? If God seems absent to you. You are not absent to him. He desire for you to see him. He desire for you to pull close to him. And as you come close to him, he will turn your head that you will see his way. He will lean your ear or bend your ear that you will hear his voice point is not to get frustrated but to draw close and to end up where Habakkuk ended up said I'll be at the lookout tower to see how God is going to act 